We're going to cover a lot of material today, so be, take notes. You know, anything you want to ask me in the end, I'm not leaving until all the questions are answered for one on it. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I get a, had a used bookstore, and I still own the store myself, though, but me and my dad started a store in 92. And throughout a couple of years in running the store there, things just went right with him. And it got to the point where he couldn't do math. And this man never needed a calculator for anything. And literally, you get to the point where people would come in, and give him a $20 bill, buying something. He'd put the 20 in the till, take it right back out, and hand it back to the person. And I'm like, geez. That was not even that bad at the point. He sometimes goes, sir, you just gave me back all my money. My dad was like, shut up, you idiot. I was like, oh my god, we're going to be out of business tomorrow. Right? It was the frustration that was overwhelming him and take, building and building and building on it, building it. So that was the start of the thing. My biggest problem that I went through at the beginning is that his doctor was almost his best friend. And I went through a two-year period where I could bring him, I'm telling the doctor, I'm like, listen, I'm telling you, we have a problem here. And my dad could hold himself together, that 15-minute visit, absolutely like nothing was wrong. I'd get him in the car, and I couldn't even convince him that we were just at the doctor's office doing it. So this doctor even got to a point where he put his finger in my face one day, and he goes, I'm going to tell you something. You are over-exaggerating this. I'm like, oh, my goodness. This doctor retired. That's how I got out of this. The guy that took over his practice, the very first appointment, he goes, man, you've got a problem here. I'm like, where have you been for two years? Right? You, we have to get these people correctly diagnosed from the beginning. It's crucial because there's so many other different types of dementia out there. I mean, we go through the list from Lewy bodies to, I mean, F FTD. And it's not easy to be diagnosed with dementia, but we've got to work on that. We've got to stick with the doctor and push them and push them if we have to on it. So we've got to make sure they're correctly diagnosed. Different symptoms, different medications, there's a big difference between the dementias. And it's important to know that. Um, I started writing a column. It was actually six years ago this Sunday, just at the anniversary and the thing on it. And uh, I've been writing about dementia. I've written three books on dementia and Alzheimer's caregiving and everything on it. So I got a lot of information to share with you. It's, that's where we're going to start. Um, what do you think is the biggest mistake a caregiver makes? OK. They start getting angry and thinking that the person is just trying to be combative with them. Okay. Anybody else? Not getting help. You already knew the answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. In my opinion, the biggest mistake you're making is not getting, because if, if you get help and you don't let things build up, you can fix these little things we're talking about. Getting angry at the patient, being in denial, all that stuff. But I'm going to tell you something. We have to start looking for help today. You can't wait to the end of this. I'm telling you this because I made all these mistakes. All right, I started this 17 years ago with my dad. He's been gone now five years. But I mean, it's the things that I made, I'm like, there was nothing for me back then 17 years ago. You guys got a lot going for yourself right now. You really do. There's a big difference between now and then on it. So where do you go for help? Support groups. We'll get into that a little bit later and everything else. But there's a lot of places where you can find help on it. And I just want you to know that. When I started taking care of my dad, it was my father, my family, my responsibilities. All right? I was wrong. Because I'm going to tell you what happens. At the end of this campaign, you don't even have time to breathe as a caregiver. If you don't look for help now, don't think you're going to be able to find it in the end. Because you don't have, you're going to be pulling your hair out of your head. We've got to be proactive. That's so very important that we do this on it. It becomes a two-person job, and that's the reality towards the end of this. I'm not going to sugarcoat this today. So I'll just let you know, we're going to talk about it honestly as we go through this on it. The number one thing you can do for anybody with dementia is going to be keeping them in a routine. Run-of-the-mill lifestyle, I'm talking breakfast the same time, lunch the same time. Keep everything in patterns. When you have no more short-term memory, you're going to find that routine is going to become their best friend on this. All right? We want to keep everything in little, it may sound simple, but um, these little pattern stuffs are going to help immensely. I used to use a little blue bowl for my dad's pills. Every morning and every evening. If I tried to hand him his pills or put them on a different plate, I had a major problem. To the point where he was accusing me of poisoning him. It just so put everything in the same. I would set the dinner table up with a knife, fork, spoon, everything in the same pattern all the time. If he was have a bowl of soup, I still had the steak knife laying there. So when he sat down, it was a pattern. All right? It might get boring for the caregiver, but what's good for the patient is going to be good for the caregiver. So the people living with dementia, routine is very good for them. We have to think about this on it. There's no right or wrong manual on this. I mean, nobody's actually getting to the point where they've written a perfect manual because every patient is different. There's a saying, if you met it, meet one Alzheimer's patient, You've met one. And by the meaning of that is everybody has different symptoms. 
as we go through this on it. So we got to just keep things in patterns as we go through this on it. Uh, if nobody's telling you you're doing a good job, pat yourself on the back, yell it out the window. Who cares? I mean, they're doing it, but you got to, we have to learn to adapt as they adapt. The disease is going to win. They have to adapt. We got to kind of learn that too as ourselves as we go through this on it. The second most important thing we need to do is we've really got to work on their anxiety levels. All right? Routine is going to help this by keeping things in a pattern. You know, we talked about routine. I made a mistake one day. I, I took my dad for a doc, two doctor's appointments in one day. Bad mistake. I think I'm going to get it all done in one shot. That was a nightmare. It wasn't even that day. I'm talking this lasted for days. Afterwards, he was still a mess. You know, instead of breaking them from the routine on it. So we got to think of the anxiety and all this stuff, the confusion, keep them in a routine is going to help. I like to analyze it like this. Say we go into a mall. We're shopping. We're in there for two hours. I'm not my type of thing. <laughs> I don't personally like it, but say we're doing this. You walk out and the parking lot's completely packed. You can't find your vehicle. This wave of panic comes washing over us. It happens to all of us. Right? But when we find the vehicle, everything subsides. For the person living with dementia, that stays with them. It's an it's a all day, all night thing on it. That confusion, that panic thing on it. So I'm not saying they're going to have bad points at the beginning, but eventually they're going to progress to the point where that confusion is going to stay with them all the time on it. So if you think about that and you had to live in that point of view all day long, it's pretty tough as we go through all this on it. So we want to work on the routines, I mean the anxiety and all that. Keep everything low. But we've got to consider the depression that's involved. All right. There's nobody that's been diagnosed with a dementia-related disease does the not go through bout. I mean, how could you not go through depression when you get diagnosed with something like this? The depression itself will cause dementia. So now you get the depression coming out of the dementia. You get the depression coming out of the disease. You stack in the two on top of each other, and you wonder why they're a mess. All right. We can't really control the dementia as much on the disease, but we can control the dementia. If you see them, they're somber, they're crying, and everything. We need to address this with their doctor. And I'm not saying, like, when they have an appointment in three months, we'll address it then. You need to get on the phone, call the doctor now, and have them addressing it. Listen, there's something wrong. The person's somber. I can see some depression building. We need to take care of that right away. Very important. It wouldn't be fair to anybody to leave anybody like that. All right? So this is something we have to address. And I mean, I hear it all the time. Well, he's got an appointment coming up in six months. I'm like, you're going to leave this person like this for six months? We need to take care of it now. And by doing this, we can control a lot. We can help, to help that person live with this a lot better on it. There's medications out there. When I started taking care of my dad, I was a person, I don't believe in medicating him. I'm, he's over-medicated. I'm not going to let that happen to him. I was wrong. There is times and places for behavior medications that's going to help control the situation. If we can keep their anxiety down, we're going to help them. This is, these are two things we've really got to concentrate on. All right? Keeping them in a routine and keeping their anxiety and depression, put that all together as we go through it. We'll call it one thing as we go through all this on it. Now, as a caregiver tool, all right, most of you might have probably already know this, but we've got to learn to use redirection. All right? Some a little, sometimes a little quick sentence might help these people. When you see they're starting to snowball, they're, you can see when the confusion's building, everything's happening, they might be fumbling in their hands, they could be pacing. I could say, I love that green on you. That's a fantastic color. That looks good on you. That might control them and bring them down. Do you? Yes. Looks good on you, looks good on them. So anyway, so we're working on that with little words, little things like that. The truth of the matter is, these sentences that redirect, they're going to stop working. Eventually, the disease is going to win, and that's not going to help on it. We can always try to use it, but I want you to work on their senses. Taste, touch, and smell can redirect them faster than anything. All right? I would give my dad a green washcloth and a blue one. I go, which one of these two do you like better? He's got them on the table. He's folding them, unfolding them. I never got an answer about the color, but that's okay. All right? He had something in his hands. It's a saying, idle hands are the devil's toys. Remember that. Sometimes they're just putting something in their hands, doing it. Redirectional tool, I had two photo albums on my kitchen table at all times. When my dad was done eating, I'd pull the plates. I'd put the photo album right in front of him. He's flipping through the pages. He's telling him about this picture. Different guy than last night. Same picture. That's okay, you know, but it kept him calm, man. It's like, tell me the whole story about this guy that was Uncle Bob yesterday, but now it's Uncle Who. You know, it doesn't matter. So it's, but it's something we want to use as redirection on it. We've got to, how, the, how are we going to turn them around? When you see that anxiety building, redirection can work on this. All right. There's something out there also called gum therapy. All right. 
And what it is, I told you, I took my dad for the doctor twice in one day, two appointments. On the way home from the second appointment, he's opening the door as I'm driving. You don't know where you're going. You're going the wrong way. I'm like, oh, my goodness. He's got his seatbelt on. Like, you got to stop opening the door, you know? I'm like a mile from the house. He's flipping out. I reach in my pocket. I grab a thing of peppermint candy. I put one in my mouth. I unwrap one. I put one in his mouth. You know what happened? All he tasted was the peppermint. That's redirection by taste. I'm going to give you a hint. Ice cream, best redirectional tool in the world. <laughs> All right? I ain't kidding about it. My dad's a nice bowl of ice cream. Drink. I get 20 minutes apiece. I'm like, are you sure you don't want another one? Because I'll bring you the whole half gallon right now, man. I need a little bit of piece on this thing on it. So that's redirection by taste. Smell. They talk about aromas that bring back different memories. That's redirection by, you know, smell. Use their senses. Even in the latter stages of the disease, their senses are going to work. All right? So that's something you've got to remember and think about as you go further on. We've got to keep them out of that, you know, that confusion, that anxiety. And that's, these are ways to do that as we work through this on it.